Hi, I'm Jennifer Nazarino, an assistant professor affiliated with the Nelson Center for Entrepreneurship. Welcome to our research uh, talk series where we expand our understanding and critically examine research related to entrepreneurship. This semester, we, we are excited to have Dr. Marsha Chatlin with us today. Dr. Chatlin received her PhD from American Studies at Brown University in 2008 and is currently full professor of history and African-American studies at, at Georgetown University. Her latest book, Franchise, The Golden Arches in Black America, examines the intricate relationship among African-American politicians, civil rights organizations, communities, and the fast food industry. Professor Chatlin was also one of the noted historians featured in the 2019 documentary titled Boss, the Black Experience in Business that chronicled the untold story, history of African-American entrepreneurship. The documentary shined a light on the story of resilience and resistance within the Black American experience in the face of racial hostility and violence, economic exclusion, segregation, and discrimination. At, short, at Georgetown, she has won several awards, teaching awards, as well as she has been <clears throat> uh, recognized for having fellowships, um, including the Eric and Wendy Schmidt Fellowship at New America, a National Endowment for the Humanities Faculty Fellowship, and the Andrew Carnegie Fellowship. Carnegie Fellowship. Based on her latest book, today, Professor Marsha Chatwin will, providing, will be providing a research talk titled, A Historical Perspective on Black and African-American Capitalism, Economic Inequalities, and the Complex Role of Franchises followed up by conversation, a conversation and questions with us. Welcome back, Dr. Chatlin to Brown, and thank you for being with us today. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Um, how's my sound? You're, it's great. Excellent, okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much um, for joining us this afternoon. Um, I am a uh, 2008 PhD from Brown's um, American Civilization Program and um, department now, and I wish I could be there in person with all of you. Um, returning to Providence is always um, so special to me um, to think about all of the ways my graduate school experience prepared me to ask questions, um, not only um, as a scholar, but as someone who had the benefit of mentorship from so many people from American studies, from Africana studies, as well as um, ethnic studies at Brown, um, to see the various ways that scholars animated um, their research in the life of the community. And so um, some of my greatest friendships and mentorships began at Brown University. And it's always so exciting um, to be able to show um, all the things I was able to do as a result of my education. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to talk a little bit about my book franchise. I'm going to share some um, slides. And then I can't wait for the conversation um, we're going to have about McDonald's, about capitalism. We can also have a conversation about COVID and the fast food industry. And I hope this is an opportunity um, for you to see the various ways that McDonald's can serve as a prism for us to understand a lot of complex uh, relationships and really challenge um, the ways that the business history of um, the McDonald's brothers, as well as Ray Kroc as the founder of the McDonald's system of franchising, um, how we can complicate that narrative when we look at uh, the ways that race um, intersects with that story. So as I do in my classes every week, I'm going to try to pull up my presentation as um, elegantly as possible uh, to start our conversation. All right, here we go. So um, when you write a book about McDonald's, um, you find yourself in a lot of conversations about fast food. And one of the things that um, fast food allows us to do, as I said earlier, is it allows us to kind of come to the same um, reference point um, because rarely have I presented in front of an audience that has never been to a McDonald's or does, or does not know what a McDonald's is. One time when I was doing a presentation for the culinary historians of New York, one person in the audience said that they had never been to a McDonald's and he was raised by vegan nutritionists and McDonald's is not in their worldview, but most people have a sense of what McDonald's is. So 
My research on McDonald's um, starts with uh, this guy. Uh, for those of you who are not old enough to remember, this is Bill Clinton. He was president of the United States when I was um, a teenager. And one of the things that I always thought was really interesting about Bill Clinton was the ways that he was talked about relative to um, his generational position as a baby boomer, as someone who um, kind of came of age in um, the 1950s, who talked about the desegregation of Little Rock Central High School as being a pivotal moment for him. But I also think a lot about the ways that um, he was described relative to Barack Obama, the first black president. So many people talk about the fact that Toni Morrison called Bill Clinton America's first black president, but very few people have actually read the essay in which Toni Morrison makes that statement. And she made that statement in relationship to the relentlessness of Congress during Bill Clinton's impeachment trial. And he, she suggested that the ways that Congress pursued the president was the ways that the justice system often pursued African-Americans. But if you look at the quote in which she describes Bill Clinton's blackness, she writes, after all, Clinton displays almost every trope of blackness, single parent household, born poor, working class, saxophone playing, McDonald's and junk food loving boy from Arkansas. And I've always found this idea really fascinating because fast food is something that is consumed globally. Um, everyone eats it. But what are the ways in which fast food has been racialized? And what does the racialization of fast food, as well as the racialization of concern about illnesses that are associated with um, high fat diets, how do we understand this from a historical lens? We have wonderful um, research that has, has come out of uh, public health and epidemiology about obesity and diabetes and the racial disparities in access to healthy foods and access to healthcare. But what we don't have, I think, is enough consideration of the historical factors that has made fast food so commonplace in communities of color. And this is where franchise begins. So the other image that I think is particularly enduring for me when I think about fast food is this one from Ferguson, Missouri in 2014. This is the McDonald's on Fluorescent Avenue that was at the center of the unrest after Michael Brown was killed on in August of 2014. And the reason why this image resonates so deeply with me is that McDonald's and civil unrest and McDonald's and racial chaos is actually part of the story of how McDonald's entered Black America. It was scenes like this in 1968 that inspired the McDonald's Corporation to rethink its relationship to the urban core. At the heart of my story is how fast food franchising became a symbol of potential for Black communities economically, an extension of the rhetoric of the post-1968 civil rights movement, and an expression of a cynical government um, attempt to try to repair urban America through a vehicle um, of business known as fast food franchising. So a few things about franchising before we begin. And if anyone in the audience owns a franchise, I would love to hear from you um, because I think franchising in many ways is the most American of American promises. You can become rich, you can become successful. You just have to simply play the game and follow the rules. So currently there are about 250,000 fast food restaurants in the United States and 759,000 businesses that are franchised. And so when we think about franchising, we often think about fast food, but a number of businesses that you've interacted with um, over the past few years can also be within that franchise system, whether it's a Hilton Hotel, um, the Hampton Inn in downtown Providence, where I've stayed a few times, that is the franchise, um, your UPS store, your FedEx Kinko's, your Midas, um, there's franchising for elder care, child care services. So this model of business in which a corporate entity sets the rules in terms of business and guarantees the right to operate one of its outlets to a franchisee 
is a very common and for some a very attractive business proposition because the franchisor does all the thinking, but the franchisee has a very heavy lift. And when we talk a little bit later about recent lawsuits against McDonald's for racial discrimination within the franchising system, we see the ways that there is a racial disparity among um, franchisees along um, race lines, and we'll talk about that. So the opening of the book, um, Fast Food Civil Rights, is a chapter that reimagines the story of McDonald's origins by thinking about um, early 20th century policies around race. And so in one thread of the McDonald's story, you have one of these two brothers from New Hampshire who go out west to try to build um, their fortunes. They try the movie industry and they strike gold with burgers after a few failed attempts at business. They create um, McDonald's in San Bernardino, California, and they take advantage of the fact that San Bernardino, Bernardino was becoming a bedroom community for um, the military and manufacturing industries in Southern California. Um, the McDonald's story often includes the story of Ray Kroc, who was the feature of the film, The Founder, starring Michael Keaton from a few years ago. Ray Kroc discovering this incredible capacity that the McDonald's brothers have to churn out burgers and to churn out profits, and then translates that into the franchising system we know today. But if you think about fast food franchising from the lens of African-American history, there's some really important things for us to keep in mind. That fast food was contingent on the building of the highway system, which we know was incredibly disruptive and um, ruinous for African-American communities across the country. We know that early McDonald's restaurants were often located in suburbs that had racially restrictive covenances or policies African-American home buyers from enjoying um, that li lifestyle. We also know that a number of veterans used the GI Bill for small business loans so that they could invest in fast food franchising, a system that African-Americans were unable to tap. So in many ways, um, the story of McDonald's development is also the story of racial exclusion in the early 20th century. And the one gem that I found during the research process was the way that McDonald's was actually a target of quite a bit of civil rights protest in the South. And the thing that I think was really interesting about this discovery was that when we think about the sit-in movement um, that was sparked in February of 1960 by the four students at North Carolina A&T and the way that it spread across the South and the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee doing sit-ins at Woolworth or Rexall Drugs, we often think about um, companies that are no longer with us, but McDonald's was among those targets um, for desegregation. And I think that um, the history that I'm gonna present was one way that McDonald's kind of wrote themselves out of the story of civil rights and reinscribed themselves in a story of black economic empowerment. So after I talk about those early years of McDonald's, I talk about this critical moment after Martin Luther King Jr.'s assassination in 1968, in which white franchise owners were concerned about doing businesses, doing business in predominantly black areas. And so what they did was they, um, gave white entrepreneurs an opportunity to leave urban areas and move to the suburbs. And there's a really eerie way that in talking about franchising, we see a lot of the same language and the same practices of the residential markets in which um, uh, white franchise owners don't want a black franchisee in their region or territory. There's this very rapid uh, change in stores between white ownership and black ownership within McDonald's. And 1968 opens up the possibility for African Americans to enter franchising, not only because McDonald's wants to protect its stores in neighborhoods that are changing its racial composition, but the Nixon administration under its black capitalism program is providing federal dollars through the Office of Minority Business Enterprise to invest in fast food. And so McDonald's McDonald's is not only taking the temperature of the nation in terms of a call for black owned businesses and a call for black economic power, but it's also taking advantage of um, this white house driven approach towards appealing to black voters by showing that Richard Nixon supports black business. 
So as I continue into the story, I look at um, people like Herman Petty, who franchised the first African-American owned McDonald's in 1968. Here he is. Um, in um, an article in the Chicago Defender and articles about black franchise owners were all over African American publications as a symbol of success and possibility. Um, the next chapter of the book, The Burger Boycott in the Ballot Box, looks at Cleveland in 1970 and a series of boycotts of McDonald's in the city. And one of the things that I try to demonstrate in the book is the way that McDonald's started to symbolize all of these kind of mixed emotions about whether Black entrepreneurship really would be able to carry um, the drive for civil rights to some semblance of success. And so in this chapter, I talk about this conflict in which African-American organizations are boycotting McDonald's and not because they're not being served as we saw in earlier protests, but because they believe that African-American um, people should franchise McDonald's in African-American neighborhoods. And at the center of this conflict is Carl Stokes, who is seeking um, re-election as mayor of Cleveland as he was the first African-American to lead a major city. Um, and these types of boycotts of McDonald's also started to define the terms of how McDonald's expected that they would proceed with African American communities and the demands of community and the de demands of business were often in conflict with each other. But the thing that I think was really interesting is that McDonald's was always considered um, the place in which these disagreements had to be um, negotiated and mediated. Um, chapter four of the book, Bending the Golden Arches, talks about attempts in the early 1970s to challenge McDonald's growing power, particularly in Black neighborhoods. This is a picture from the FBI file that was placed on the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense in Portland. They were eventually accused of bombing a McDonald's because they refused to donate to their free breakfast program for children. Now, whether or not they actually bombed that McDonald's is in question, but the issue at hand again was what kind of member of the black community would McDonald's be? And these conflicts um, were all over the country. So in Portland, it was the issue with the Black Panther Party. Um, in Philadelphia and the Ogons neighborhood, it was this idea of community control of which businesses and which entities would operate in black communities. Um, some African American celebrities tried to siphon off the consumer loyalty to McDonald's by creating their own brand. Here's Muhammad Ali outside of Champ Burger, his um, own pork free version of fast food that he tried to um, pilot in Miami. Mahalia Jackson, the um, gospel singers tried to create a true black owned black power franchise system with Mahalia's glory fried chicken. And this attempt again to get into McDonald's was the ways that you see fast food franchising starting to symbolize an economic development tool for black communities that could um, allow black people control over which resources came into their community and who was benefiting from it. And the final few chapters of the book goes into um, the cultural life of McDonald's in terms of looking at the ways that African-American advertising firms and market research firms contributed to McDonald's popularity with Black consumers by taking approach of not only validating Black consumers, but trying to create the image that McDonald's was a place in which African-Americans could dine without the anxiety and out of the without the fears that they had experienced in a pre-Civil Rights Act of 1964 climate. I also talk about the ways that McDonald's was integral in normalizing corporate um, sponsorship of the Martin Luther King Jr. holiday after its passage in 1983, when it was still incredibly controversial, as well as their underwriting of things like gospel tours, double Dutch leagues, and the All-American uh, basketball game. And after this look into culture, 
I return to um, the 1980s and a period of time in which McDonald's was being accused of racial bias in its assignment of franchise locations. And we saw very similar allegations recently with a filing um, that involved 52 franchise owners, black franchise owners who are arguing that they were being redlined or kept out of um, white neighborhoods, out of suburbs, out of certain regions, and that there was racial bias in the assignment of the opportunity. And during these conflicts, people like Jesse Jackson, who's pictured here, and if you look right behind him, there's Al Sharpton, um, organizations like Operation Push, as well as the National Action Network, were integral in mediating these conflicts about racial discrimination within the franchise system, as well as within these corporations. But what often led to the, um, but often these conflicts, the agreement at the end of it would be to create more franchise restaurants in African American communities. And this was a big contributor to the hyper saturation of fast food restaurants we see in African American communities. And this approach to negotiating with corporations was really um, piloted at piloted by the Los Angeles chapter of the NAACP and then NAACP chapters across the country would negotiate these fair share agreements in which corporations would allow for more franchise ownership as well as more contracts with black um, creative agencies, black banks and black insurance companies. And the National Black McDonald's Operators Association becomes an important kind of um, bridge between these civil rights conflicts and the McDonald's Corporation. And the final chapter um, starts with one of the stories about McDonald's that got me interested in this research. And this is something I call the miracle of the golden arches. And shortly after the Los Angeles uprising in 1992, after things calmed down, uh, McDonald's CEO Ed Renzi released a press, um, a report to the press saying that no McDonald's restaurant was harmed during the uprising 1992. And that that essentially was vindication for a quarter century of socially progressive actions like opening up franchising to African Americans. And I thought that claim was so ridiculous and so strange um, to suggest that um, McDonald's presence in black communities could actually insulate it from unrest and being a target of unrest that it got me down the rabbit hole to see if this was actually true. And we can talk a little bit more about the veracity of this claim, but what's interesting about it is that it is something that is often reproduced in business studies about corporate social responsibility and the importance of investment. And considering that the uprising after Martin Luther King's assassination in 1968 brought McDonald's into black communities, I think it was interesting that 24 years later that McDonald's said that this is what protected it during the Los Angeles uprising. And so as we think about McDonald's and we think about the ways that fast food animates a series of questions about health and nutrition, about workers' rights and wages, um, I hope that my business history and business analysis um, has one very clear message about the dangers of using business as a means of repairing the breaches society has with a group of people. That one of the reasons why franchising became um, a fixation in the 1960s is that it was a sense that it could actually respond to the causes of unrest in 68. Not just the grief over King's assassination, but the idea that it could then create jobs, it could reinvest communities, invest in communities, it could quell the tensions like police brutality, um, the lack of fair housing, the lack of opportunity in Black America. And this is just not true. And so um, by the view of 1968, for the people who invested in this idea, they really saw real hope and possibility. But I think in many ways, what we've learned over five decades is a cautionary tale that we still have to learn, that you cannot um, repair um, the damages caused by racist structures and inequality and racial violence by business investment. It just doesn't work that way. And so with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen so we can get into the conversation. I look forward uh, to this conversation with, uh, with Jennifer. And um, thanks so much for uh, joining this uh, presentation.
Oh, oh well, thank you for uh, your talk and, and, and going over your book with us. So I hear you on this notion of, um, you know, you, you saying that business can't, you know, heal or repair the huge inequities that are that uh, amongst our country around social social conditions of our country. But what is the role of black businesses? What is the role of black entrepreneurship in the United States? Like, what, what is your take on that? So for so long, African American business owners have had to be the unelected officials of black America, because of so much um, political, economic, and social disenfranchisement. So the person who's owning the funeral homes is also doing loans, is also supporting um, the scholarship program, is also negotiating with the sheriff for the release of someone who is detained. Like it's, it's all of these roles. And while I think that this has been a great source of pride, I think that this is unfortunately one of those many stopgap measures that African Americans are forced to deploy because of their inability to access the resources that the state is supposed to make possible for everyone. So what's the role of business? It's like the role of people. Pay your fair share in taxes, um, be a good citizen and see what comes from that. And I think that this story, um, as I was writing it, I was so uncomfortable because on one hand, I think that there is an important um, role for histories to, to talk about the kind of um, barriers that African-Americans have had with success in business. And I think that um, there's something incredible to see the level of philanthropy and generosity that Black business people have shown in their community. But I don't think that this is a sustainable or reasonable way for us to actually plan for the future. How much a franchise owner makes selling burgers shouldn't have an impact whether a historically black college can keep its doors open or get a new library or that people in the community can have sports for their children after school, right? So it's these relationships that make me uncomfortable. So a business, um, you know, in the ways that, uh, you know, people grouse about LeBron Brick, James should stick to, you know, stick to dribbling, stay, stick to baseball or basketball rather, um, in the same way as that um, McDonald's should just stick to burgers. I don't want McDonald's determining the quality and access of resources in black communities. McDonald's should pay their fair share in taxes and we should be able to live within a structure where those taxes are redistributed so people can have health care, people can send their kids to school, they don't have to worry about their safety and health that they have paid sick leave, and then we just do that. Anytime we start to talk about corporate social responsibility or corporate philanthropy, that signals to me that there is a failure within our larger social structure or there is a hole in that safety net that isn't being met. So I let and to keep going with that. So like we, me and you talked about earlier that, um, and I hear you on you know, you know the lack of the welfare state. So that plays a you know because of the lack of the welfare state, then we have private businesses that often can be the default for for attempting to bridge you know some of those services to the population. Um, but then we also me and you talked about this this tension there or like that business ownership and, and entrepreneurship has been a, a mode of socioeconomic mobility for minorities and African-Americans. And so can you speak a little bit more about that tension that, you know, like as we talked about earlier, and I just would want to kind of have you elaborate on that tension that, that that has been a mechanism for a lot of minorities in terms of achieving some level of success, but then couch that within, you know, the history, the, this notion of white flight that you talk about, um, just like, can you contextualize that for us? Yeah, I, you know, I think we have to challenge the premise of economic mobility. I, it is true. And there's like a giant asterisk that like rests on it. Um, because I think that the, you know, the pandemic um, has inspired a lot of people to write these articles, it's this interesting moment we're in because the pandemic has allowed us an upper, another lens into seeing the ways that um, black owned businesses are always on the outside of every type of like opportunity. So the number of people who are able to really get payment protection um, um, loans, right? So like the PPP loans, those were received at a much lower rate for, for black businesses. And then we learn that 
um, you know, of the few hundred thousand black owned businesses, the numbers that actually employ more than one person, right? So you're talking about business ownership in which people are working other jobs. Then we realize that there is a $30,000 gap just in access to um, kind of personal funds versus borrowed funds between a white owned business, black owned business. And then we're thinking, wait a second, um, black business symbolically is so important and can be very economically important, but the types of scales that we're talking about, I, I, I don't know if we can really say it's been a vehicle for social mobility, for socioeconomic mobility on the scales that we wish it to be. Mm -hmm. So I think there's that. There's the precarity question. I think that um, keeping a business for more than one generation is also really impossible, right? So we already have this impossible, small business is hard. And then we put in all of these other factors. But I will say this, that in the same ways that people established small business because they were shut out of opportunity, mm -hmm. are the same ways that people embrace business for the kind of autonomy that yeah. being outside of, you know, corporate structures, being outside of the kind of racism and the disappointment of the lack of promotion, um, you know, within the a more traditional job structure, there is some value to it. So I don't want to um, demean it, but I think we really have to talk about scale and impact mm -hmm. because I think that we are in a moment because of our George Floyd summer is that there is a romantic idea of black entrepreneurship and business mm -hmm. as if it creates not only socioeconomic mobility, but it also reduces the stresses of other factors. And I don't think it quite works like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then so I want to also take it back to like I, I I hear you on that point, but I also want to like you've history in your book you talk about you know also this notion of the emotions and memory that McDonald's brought forth, right? Yeah. Like so, there's that complicated, you know, oh, really understanding like what given the place and time when uh, franchise black ownership around uh, entre, um, black ownership with McDonald's, you know McDonald's franchising. What did it elicit during the late 1960s after this, you know, during the civil rights struggle in, and after MLK was assassinated? Can you talk a little bit more? See, that's another piece of it that you uncover in your book. And I want to, and I try to be as sensitive as possible about it because I think it's real. Um, there was a day I, I went up to New York and um, I went to the um, Paley Center, uh, the media center to watch old McDonald's uh, commercials. And I sat there like in this little like carol for, I don't know, two, three hours, just watching McDonald's commercials. I was so filled with emotion and tears. And I couldn't even tell you why, um, because marketing is good. Advertisers are very smart. They know where we live. And the thing that I think is important to understand is that sometimes um, a blogger or sometimes a publication will circulate old McDonald's um, ads that were targeted to African-Americans. And they're like, wow, this is really racist and uncomfortable. Yes, it is. And at the same time, the communication at the time was to reduce the anxieties of people who not only were kind of shut out of um, kind of consumer culture, but any kind of wrong move could cost you your life or you could um, sustain great injury. If you go into a restaurant that was the wrong restaurant, if you found yourself lost, if you found yourself too far away from home. So the ways that McDonald's used affect to talk to black consumers about a place where you can be belong, something that is part of your neighborhood. Like if we think about the kind of property destruction that happened in 1968, and in some sections of the country, there hasn't been any development or any building on the same spaces that were burned out in 1968. So you have this great economic white flight that's happening with black businesses. You have the residential white flight that is affecting the tax base. And then a McDonald's comes in and a black person owns it mm -hmm. and they're having ads in black radio and they're doing special promotions in your community. And, you know, that matters. And so as much as I have a million and a half critiques of thinking that business can solve problems, I am not so like arrogant or out of touch as to not understand why people were so excited and so hopeful about this model. And the other thing that I think is important to note is that, um, you know, McDonald's, um, as it was building as a national brand, it became um, it became this place that in some areas it was becoming the kind of um, 
the the opposite of the um, mom and pop that would not respect your rights or the mom and pop that would deny you service. And so I when I was on my book tour in the before times, I was in Kansas City and a woman you know, told me the story of the first time she had McDonald's ice cream. She went on a date to a McDonald's and it was so special because she had grown up in a Jim Crow context. And so her grandma never let them use a colored window to get ice cream. They just ate ice cream at home. And here she was at a McDonald's in Kansas City. It was owned by a black person and she could go get ice cream whenever she wanted. Um, those things actually are really important to understanding um, the reasons why the public health interventions that just focus on the food and not the context and not the emotions and not the affect, I think are really failing to understand these complex relationships. Hmm. And so the I, I want to also this notion of, you know, the, this notion of affect and what it meant to be in a McDonald's that that for the first time, uh, federal policy uh, provided this where we were allowed to be in desegregated restaurants, right? That that really, I mean, meant something for, for people that grew up around that time to actually just be in a space where they could order ice cream, so to speak, and not feel like they have to be at a separate counter or order it at a separate window. And I hear you when you say like, do businesses help, you know, alleviate problems, but there's the, the tension I have is that having done research around immigrant entrepreneurship and sometimes we can't wait for government at times. A lot of immigrants and minorities start businesses because waiting for government policy to change has, you know, takes a long time. And so I've also found it too, where a lot of minorities that do open small businesses or build ethnic enclaves for this sense of community and having businesses that support them economically, how do we have make space for that? How do we make space for that, you know, when government has failed us in certain ways or certain policies are not serving minorities and, 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 and people of color, how, what is, what, is there a role for, can there be a role for business? I mean, I, I, I sit there with that we can have space for both and I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that. Well, I think this is an important um, point you raise about the origins of small business across communities of color, because um, what happened after 68, I think was also really telling because people um, were really excited initially after, um, you know, after Watts in, in 65 and um, all of these uprisings, there's all of this concern about what are we going to do about these cities that are on fire? What are we going to do? What are we going to do? Okay, investment's going to come. We're going to do these public-private partnerships. People are going to be able to open businesses. And a person comes with a business plan for a small bookstore or a cafe or small manufacturing plan, you know, to make soap. And they're like, well, this isn't a real business or the banks are like, we're not gonna back this, this isn't a good idea. But what is able to push through are fast food franchises because they have this incredible capital engine behind them and they have this incredible mechanism. And I think it's important to make that distinction because this is where people were really um, not only critical but really confused as to what, what the action was. When we talk about small business, are we talking about a McDonald's franchise in Detroit? Mm -hmm. Is it a small business? And this is the big question. Grocery stores weren't small businesses, but fast food franchises were small businesses. Um, that bookstore on the, the, the black bookstore, they weren't gonna survive. Your better bet is this McDonald's, but they're both under this umbrella of black owned small business, but they're not, it's a scale issue. And so all of this is to say that, you know, the federal policies that I talk about in my book, they were really designed for the franchise. They weren't really the programs, the small grants from the Ford Foundation, um, the types of initiatives that Robert Kennedy was thinking about before he was assassinated, those kind of small scale things those were not the ones that were getting the dollars that were really necessary to keep it afloat. Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, in immigrant communities, what we saw was um, there was there wasn't that kind of access, but as those networks grew, there were financial instruments that were within communities that people could borrow against, 
that they could use to negotiate various kind of networks of supply that replicated some of that stuff, not at the same scale, but replicated some of that kind of certainty that allowed some businesses to succeed and others to fail. And one of the things that happens within the franchising sector for the lower entry point um, franchises, your Subways, your Krispy Kreme donuts, you see a lot of immigrant communities pursuing those paths and finding it really hard to hold on to those businesses. True. No, I thank you for that. I mean, I, I, I thank you for bringing that context. But so like, let's talk about today. Let's mm -hmm. talk about today, right? Um, we're at the Nelson Center for Entrepreneurship. We definitely have students that are aspiring to be entrepreneurial. We have minorities and African-American students that, you know, definitely are thinking about being business owners. And what would your advice be, given that you've provided this historical context, given that you have shared with us this untold history of, around how Black business owners uh, came into franchising in the late 1960s and how they came into it because of white, the complications about white flight and the context of um, being in some ways segregated in some ways and building businesses in their Black communities. Now that in 2000, in 2020, what, what would your advice be to, for students that are the that are thinking of being more entrepreneurial and and possibly about you know doing some sense of social good with their entrepreneurial yeah i mean i think that you know i mean i had the pleasure of teaching brown undergraduates when I was a graduate student so is there any is there anything a brown undergraduate can't do i mean my gosh what an incredibly talented and thoughtful group of students um who really understand about kind of making a difference wanting to set the bar really high for themselves and excelling. Um, so I think that the secret is, is that um, you, as you build kind of whatever business, whatever kind of entrepreneurial path you want to take, that the reality even, this is something I struggled with in the book because there's this whole section about um, Black franchise owners appealing to the NAACP because they feel like they're being discriminated in McDonald's. And when I first came upon this, I was like appalled. How dare they use a civil rights organizations because they're millionaires and not multimillionaires? Like, how dare they? And a colleague said, well, isn't this what the rich do? They they use the legal system to their advantage. And I thought, gosh, that is true. And so all of this is to say that even in systems in which you see um, entrepreneurs of color able to become financially successful, there will always be a context because of race and because of access to resources in which they're never as rich as they could have been had they been white. And this is the thing that I think can sometimes be like really kind of jarring for people who believe that you can innovate or enterprise your way out of racism. A, that doesn't exist. So what do we do? We use our business clout, we use all of the influence we have to advocate for policies that are good for people because when people are in a good place, business is in a good place. When you want to make sure that your workers don't show up sick and prepare food, when you want to make sure that you have a workforce that you can depend on for years and not just months, um, you advocate for the policies in which the state provides the baseline needs of people so that your salaries and your wages make sense in the life of people who work within your infrastructure and work with for you. Canceling student debt will be one of the best ways to create entrepreneurship because you're not saddled with hundreds and thousands of dollars of debt because you can't start a business when you are saddled with debt. Your credit is terrible and no one wants to lend to you. So we, we advocate for canceling student debt. We advocate for um, you know, Medicare for all. Everyone has health care. And so your workers aren't doing bananas things like working three jobs to try to afford their premiums. This is the last, this is the last of my campaign speech and then I'll stop. <laughs> when I, I graduated college in 2001 mm -hmm. and I remember distinctly, and those of you who are my age or older remember this, do you remember when jobs just didn't provide health care? So you had to get a second job so you could have the job you wanted. And this was a perfectly normal practice. I got a job at a nonprofit. They don't really have health care. So I'm going to work at Starbucks 21 hours a week. And so I can buy into health care there or you just didn't have health insurance. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah, like when I was a kid, I just didn't have health insurance because we couldn't afford it. This is the most dangerous practice in the United States. Talk about living in a high risk life. So you just have to be lucky that you don't get sick or you avoid trying to get sick. And then that's your life. And then the Affordable Care Act came and it has a lot of problems. But I no longer had to talk to students about what your other job is going to be so that you could get sick one day. I mean, it's wild to think about, right? So what do business owners do? We put pressure for Medicare for all or some type of single payer system. I know this is Brown. We can have 10 discussions about the best way to do this. And that way we can have workers who are like, oh, I'm sick. I'm going to take a few days off and I'll come back well. We make sure that our workers have childcare. So they're not saying I can't come to work today because my kid has nowhere to go. We advocate for a federal government that just pays us to stay home during a pandemic and your businesses will be that much stronger. And so I think that instead of thinking about, am I going to donate to Girl Scouts? Am I going to give to this food pantry? How am I gonna use my business influence to make sure we have humane policies so that people can work and create and innovate at their full capacity? Last comment, we don't know how good we are. We really don't because we have had structures of inequality that have kept um, people of color and have women and LGBTQ people and people with disabilities out of the most creative spaces. We don't know how good we are because we have workers who are saddled with debt and they're sick and they have got kids and they're trying to go to work all the time. We eliminate those problems and then we can have, you know, like flying cars like in the Jetsons and we can have like whatever. We have no idea how good we are because we we haven't had a structure um, that allows us to be free to really do that. Yeah. No, I thank you. I love what you just said right there. Um, I, Yes, <laughs> all I can say is yes, yes. Um, I, in terms of your, I'm going to open it up to the audience. We have 10 more minutes uh, left, but just there was a question uh, that we had received is how did you, why, what made you interested in, I mean, we take for granted that there's McDonald's everywhere. The question was like, how did you become interested in this, writing a book around this? What was your first uh, memory of McDonald's and why were, you know, why, why this book? Why, what was the premise? And then um, please feel free. I want to just open up to the audience. After. Yeah, I, I mean, I ate McDonald's all the time as a kid. I kind of grew up in the generation where you, it wasn't a big deal if you ate McDonald's all the time. And I see um, Danny Ritchie's here, who's an incredible um, doctor and um, advocate for public health that I met at um, at uh, Brown. And so I'm sure, you know, you, you remember, like, there's some people just like let their kids eat fast food and it wasn't a thing. And it was when I actually went to Brown, um, when I was working on my PhD. And when you work on your dissertation, you come up with new interests because you can't deal with your the task at hand. And I became more interested in food issues and food justice. And the thing that bothered me was there was such a contemptuous way in which people of color were framed as either bad or irresponsible parents because their kids ate fast food or they ate fast food. And I, and I thought a lot about the ways that fast food was such a reasonable and smart choice um, for a number of reasons. When I was a kid, it was fast, it was cheap. You didn't have to worry about a number of factors. And I thought to myself, why can't we tell a backstory of how this process happened in order to think about fast food in society today, that I felt like it was an ahistorical argument about a natural affinity between people of color and fast food. And mm -hmm. there's no such thing, right? Yeah. So yeah. I started thinking about that a lot. And also growing up in Chicago, black franchise owners were everywhere. They yeah. sponsor everything. And the first substantive engagement I had with African-American history was in um, a high school quiz bowl game show. And it was sponsored by black McDonald's franchise owners. So without them, I wouldn't have learned about the great migration, which was the basis of my dissertation, which shows you the utter failure of our school system. But there we are. <laughs> All right, I definitely want, we have a few minutes. I definitely want to open it up to the audience. Feel free to um, unmute yourself and, and ask a question for Dr. Marcia Chatlin. Questions? I have a question. Sure. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Oh my God, it's so good to see you. You're so grown up. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Just had to say that. Um, no, I think this is great, and I'm going to run out and buy the book. Um, I think my question was um, is really about you know this the whole idea about business um, and 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 the franchise and McDonald's coming in you know during the civil unrest and how it 
it seems to me that it is used to um, to actually almost say, look, you know, um, you have an opportunity now, like yes. civil rights has been successful and you can now be a success too. And so it kind of dampens down and, 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 and negates the continued inequalities that exist as well as then, you know, kind of um, showing, you know, other blacks what they need to do, how they should just buy into the system and they'll be successful too. So I just wanna know that that's kind of what you talk about to or see. Yeah, it's so complicated because um, what's so weird about the whole enterprise is that McDonald's latches onto it very quickly and they start, um, when they get accused of racial discrimination within the franchising system, there's this guy who, you know, the, the great um, tragedy of his life is that there was no Twitter around when he was in this fight with McDonald's because he was so witty. Um, you know, he says that McDonald's is redlining him out of white neighborhoods and he wants to make money there too. And McDonald's says, but we gave you an opportunity to do business in your community. And his response is, I'm a millionaire. I live in Bel Air. That is my community. And it's this really interesting conversation about gratitude and, you know, where would you be without us? And in the same ways that McDonald's is using that tone to talk to Black franchisees who are unhappy, um, for Black franchisees who are employing Black people in Black communities, it gets very complicated even to this day where um, Black franchise owners who can say to their Black employees who want to unionize, who want better wages, well, I'm being squeezed too. You know what they're doing to me. And so I would love to help you, but I just can't. And so you see the ways that people are managing these ideas of I'm being successful, I'm working for my community, and I'm getting the short end of the stick, which you kind of are, but then there's always these other layers of power. But McDonald's graphs itself very, very quickly to a civil rights narrative that's so weird. You know, Ray Kroc was not a friend of civil rights and neither was um, Richard Nixon, but they both kind of pull this like Trump thing, like no president has done more for black people than me. And you're like, really, are we doing this? And it's, it's amazing um, the kind of rhetorical moves they make and then the black franchise owners also see themselves as an extension of King's dream. And, you know, I talk about in the book, like the last speech that um, King gives is about kind of economic justice. It's about the sanitation workers in Memphis and the need for us to stand in solidarity and feel the pain that they're feeling. And within a year, um, on the commemoration of, of King's assassination, his successor, Ralph Abernathy, is taking a check from a McDonald's franchise owner in King's memory, right? Like, these things get really complicated. And I think without a really sophisticated or clear understanding of the dimensions of history, it sounds real. But then when you take a step back, you're like, wait, wait, what are we talking about here? So yeah, there's a, there's a lot of that kind of discourse. There's a question from Dana Redden. Um, Hi, Marsha, very interesting work. Thank you. Can you share more of your perspective on CSER, on CSR and ESG? I don't think I know it. CS. I think corporate social responsibility. Oh, oh okay. And I don't, ES, ESG, I'm not sure what. Yeah, corporate social responsibility. Um, you know, corporate social responsibility, I'm, I'm, I, I actually think McDonald's was one of the really good, um, innovators in what that is conceptually because they did this thing where they had an expectation of all their franchise owners in, in the early days to be part of their community and for their philanthropy to reflect that and they did it in a kind of hands-off way and that's how you have the Ronald McDonald house for families that um, you know have children who are you know going through all sorts of you know medical procedures and then you have all these incredible charities um, you know, corporate social responsibility, I guess, is fine, but it can't it can't substitute for kind of um, corporate tax accountability, right? Like, I think that one of the consequences of privatization, and you know, as we know, as we talk about often, the neoliberal turn is that we cannot imagine um, delivering anything in for the public good. D by only using public resources and, and, and public talent and will. And so I think that it makes things a little murky when corporate social responsibility is often the measure of how we um, assess a company's 
doing good rather than the quality of the work they provide and them using their influence to change policies that help everyday people. You know, environmental and social governance, I don't know tons about, but you know what's really interesting? This is the other book I should have written. I might have to go back for another PhD to be really ready to write this. Um, the, one of my colleagues who also does um, fast food research is doing one about the global history of fried chicken and supply chain. If I went back and rewrote franchise, I think I would need to write another chapter about the supply chain, about what the ascendancy of fast food has done in terms of the environmental impact. We need so many chickens. I tell this to my students, they're so tired of hearing this. Do you remember when a rotisserie chicken wasn't something you could purchase any day of the week? Remember when the before rotisserie ovens were readily available, you couldn't just eat a roasted chicken all the time and then you could and now the number of pol the amount of poultry that every person is eating is bananas add that to the fact that kfc has become one of the leading global brands because chicken has fewer um religious um, prohibitions against it around the world and the number of chickens that we have today the supply fight supply chain for chicken is fundamentally changing the world. Um, Alex Park is the person who's writing that book. Um, those are the types of kind of issues that when we talk about environmental and social governance, you know, a company will say we're donating or we're not polluting waters, but demand is part of the problem of environmental impact. And I think that those two conversations are sometimes so distant from each other that we think, okay, the fast food industry doesn't use styrofoam anymore. Um, you know, they're doing more socially responsible things in terms of waste management, but the supply, the fact that you can get so many things on a McDonald's menu. No restaurant is meant to provide beef, chicken, pork, um, pineapples, all in the same time. These are the things I'm so obsessed with, obviously. Uh, I, we have one more minute. Um, I, have, I have a question. Oh, sure. Go ahead. Hi. Well, hello. So, I, so, um, so Dr. Chatelain, when I was growing up, um, so my parents are immigrants and my mom, she would always talk about Bill Clinton and the McDonald's runs. Oh. And, and I really enjoyed your section on that. And she would always uh, warn us about the consequences of like of eating McDonald's. Um, I have, you're, you're, you're telling, you're, you're grounding, uh, like I see your motivation in grounding the story in a historical narrative about how this came to be. And you mentioned something about the interest in diseases that come from high fat diets. Could you, could you talk more about that and like what it says about our perspective and how this, that, that problem could pos potentially be addressed? So I think that um, for people who have been fighting the good fight around health disparities and trying to get this research out, um, they've told us incredible things about diet and illness. Um, and I think it has taken the work of uh, public health um, practitioners who understand race and capital to really tell a fuller story, right? Um, you can tell me that eating kale is probably better than eating French fries, but French fries are so good. Um, but I also need to help you understand that if the only black owned business in my community is the McDonald's and I'm kind of proud of it, then telling me those fries are really bad for me, but I can say, but they're good for my community because this is the guy who's giving out. If you go on Instagram on the black McDonald's operators kind of Instagram, they're showing people giving away turkeys for the holidays and backpacks with iPads so kids can do remote learning. It puts me in a real kind of, just, you know, a dis-ease about this, right? So am I not going to support that person who supported me? And so I think the question is, can we imagine a context in which a food choice is just a food choice because there are many choices that can be made? And I think that ultimately, you know, we, we have the capacity to do it. The question is, do we have the political will to make it happen? I do have to... I, I, I... We are over time, but I do want to just say thank you, Marsha, Dr. Kevin, for joining us and for really this fascinating story that gives us this background that is an untold history around the origins of Black business owning and Black entrepreneurship, and just for us to critically think about it much more and, and not be ahistorical, but bring in the historical context. Um, so thank you again. Uh, we appreciate your time, and please feel free to follow you. You are 
always on Twitter, I, I hear. So I'm always on Twitter. I know I, Twitter. instead of writing that extra chapter for franchise. <laughs> thanks everyone. And thanks for my colleagues, um, like yeah. fellow historians for coming. Um, and this was really great. I hope next time I'm at Brown, it's in yeah. real life in person. Definitely want to meet you in person. Thank you again. Bye. Bye. Thank you.